Hello, and welcome to your first of many lectures. Um, what we're going to have today is a slideshow that, that goes along um, with what we have to learn. We don't have a textbook. I don't make you do the readings. Uh, you should get all the information here from the slideshow. Uh, just to give you an idea, because it's our first one, you should also have this that goes along with it. So before I even begin, you should have done the four square for agricultural. You should have done the four square for industrial. And now you should be ready to take notes. Um, so like for instance, I would be up here and I would, I would be putting my title in. Uh, I'm sure Sperry said it, but I wanted to hear just in case later. You'll notice that there's one, two, three activities that go along with it. Um, just to give you an idea, these are drag and drop sheets. So this sheet moves over, it moves back. I can move it however I want. Um, supposed to be able to move it. There we go. Um, and I can keep on playing around with it. Uh, you each will have your own copy. Therefore, I will have an example to see if you've been paying attention and doing it uh, along with here. With that being said, let's get to today's lecture. The great part about this video, guys, is that it has a pause button. So while I'm going to go fast, if you need to me slow down, you need me to slow down or you need to pause it, you can. Uh, you can have two screens open using the uh, app up here. I uh, forget which one it's called, but I should have had you download it. The Tab Resize app. Use it. All right? And then have two screens open. You can take notes while you're here. You can go back and forth by having two tabs like I have here. Uh, it's great. This slideshow is available on my website. Therefore, you can cut and paste if you really are that lazy. But uh, Cornell Notes, as we'll talk about in class, don't take that much. Um, especially because you kind of know what's key. All right, with that being said, let's get to the presentation. All right, today's notes. As it says on slide one, are about the agricultural and industrial revolution. So what that means, the agricultural revolution were changes in technology and science that increased the production of food. It had massive and great increases that allowed people to live longer, healthier lives because they had greater access to food as well as produced more food than people. So we could, we could increase the amount of people that existed. The next uh, slide, right? So what do those advances look like? Number one, we use selective breeding. We took animals, we found the biggest, fattest, strongest ones, and we reproduced them with other animals that were equally big and fat and strong. So we doubled our positive qualities. It got rid of weak, meager cows. So if I wanted to have beef, I had bigger, fatter cattle. Um, I got rid of the sickly ones, right? I got rid of the embred ones, the ones that didn't give me what I want. If I wanted a horse to work my farm, I bred it with stronger horses so that my next round of, of animals was even stronger than the one before. So that selective breeding created bigger, stronger animals. It also produced more meat and fur, which will become, you know, we'll talk about that later. We have the triangular plow. You can see the picture here. Uh, this guy is working on the plow. These, house, these horses are pulling it. It allowed me to take one field and dig the whole thing up with one dude and two horses. This previously took several, several people to do it in the common area. And we required us to have hoes, it required us to have shovels, it was heavy, it was hard, you know, it increased fatigue, it just wasn't a healthy way to do it. With the plow, we could do it faster, we could do it better. Also had the seed drill. So once I had the plows out, I could run the seed drill and then evenly space out my seeds so that everything could be planted. It kept every uh, thing in a universal depth, so it was deep enough in the soil to receive water but also not so shallow that animals could get to it. It also let me put them evenly spaced so that, that seeds could then, that plants could equally grow without growing on top of each other and steal each other's nutrients. Um, similar to what you see today in a field where everything's in straight lines and everything really even spaced, that comes because of things like the plow and the seed drill. Next we have the thresher. Here it takes a, a plant like oats, barley, corn, some of the stalk, feeds it through. While it feeds it through, it's going to beat the seeds out of it. So now I have seeds for next time. But also remo remove the husks and remove the stalks. So if I needed hay for my animals, I could have hay. I can then have the seeds for planting. Uh, it just drastically increased the job of, I mean, imagine having to cut down a plant, pull out all the seeds. 
um, and, and then single-handedly do it all by hand. It just, again, reduced hard work, reduced effort, and reduced time and energy. So now I needed less people to do the job, and I could actually do more. And then we came up with this wonderful scientific system called the four-field crop rotation. Two fields, you could have cash crops, like wheat and barley, things people used to make bread and food, and cereal, are called cereal grains, because kind of what we make cereal out of. The other two fields would be forage crops, turnips, clovers, potatoes are another example of these. These two tops, the, these two up top, wheat and barley, are what are called they're nitrient takers. They take nitrates out of the soil that are essential for growing. And things like forage crops, like turnips and clover, put those nitrates back in. So one year I planted wheat and barley to take out the nitrates. The next year I plant turnips and clovers to put them back in, back and forth and back and forth. Turnips and clovers may not have been eaten, but they could have then been foraged by animals like the cattle and the horses that I was I was raising. So again, it gave me, gave me a, another bonus. But again, the idea is I'm taking away nitrates and putting them back in. Therefore, my soil is healthier and it creates more food. Kind of seems to be the, the habit here. Here's an example. Right, field one is wheat, field two, barley, field three, turnips, field three. And then every year I just rotate them. This, all four of these fields will get rotated, and they would kind of help each other grow. What does that mean? It means that there's going to be a population shift. Prior to that agricultural revolution, most land was considered common land. It's hard to work. You needed multiple people to do it. And again, there wasn't a lot of money in it because population was so low. So there was no reason for the king or the manor owner um, to need that, that cash crop. So instead, he let the people farm it. And, you know, if I went out there and farmed for a year, the king would then, or the manor, uh, would then take some of my product from me as kind of a tax. Um, that's, that changes. Now that we have farms that can be productive and one person can work that farm and create a ton of food that can then be sold, uh, that land land becomes valuable, really valuable. They pass what's called the Enclosure Act. This Enclosure Act encloses the land and stricts all these common people of use. So now if I'm uh, living in the city or living on the manor, I cannot go out to the farm and farm my own crops. It is illegal. I cannot take my animals and let them graze on your farm. It, at this point, it's now all shut down to wealthy landowners. So it drastically reduces the common person's ability to eat, to farm, and to live. So they need to go somewhere. Where can I get money? Where can I work? How can I feed my family? Because now the manor has taken all my food and now producing it on their own and they want to get paid. And I don't have that money. Here's an example of the kind of person that would own the manor. There's me and my fat cat throwing dollar bills. That would be the guy that would kick you out of your manor so you no longer had food to feed yourself or your family. Right, again, there's also less labor. So, I mean, if there's a lot of labor, that manor owner could hire me to work his farm, but he didn't need me. He had his plow, he had his seed dweller, he had his thresher. There's no work. Now there's no land. I cannot survive out in the farmland. Also, there's an overproduction of goods. There's an abundance of food. I can easily purchase it if I have a job. So I need to find a place that offers me cheap housing and abundant labor so that I can afford the food that I used to grow myself. Leads us to industry and the industrial revolution. This revolution starts with clothing. This is an example of a old school loom that would be used to create fabric that was replaced by uh, it wouldn't look exactly like this, but here we have a power loom uh, and, a, and a spinning jenny that would then create fabric and turn it into textiles at a much faster pace. Imagine how many t-shirts you can make in a day with this compared to this. Right? So production goes way, way up. It also decreases cost. I have a cheap cloth that can easily be made into fabrics. So the guy who's making all the cloth, the owner of the factory, is making a ton of money. It also requires people to work. So I need to be able to produce all this crap. It means I need to have people working in these factories. So textile factories begin to hire. 
On top of that, we have the production of iron and steel. So this new smelting process for iron, I believe it's called the Bessemer process, produces a cheaper product. So all of a sudden, people who want to build something out of iron or steel can do so with little to no money. And this cheap iron and steel became vital. Not only was it cheap, uh, it was also strong. So you're getting a great product for that cheap, cheap price. Therefore, uh, things like skyscrapers happen. Things like metal boats, the railroad. All these things are going to happen because we have cheap access to these strong metals. Get letting growth occur. All of that now leads to the steam engine. Right, so we have cheap steel, we have cheap production, we can make cheap rails. Now I have an engine that runs off of coal, so I can now burn coal uh, through the steam engine to run on these rails. Increased transportation means easier transportation of people as well as food. So that guy who owns a farm in the middle of nowhere can now get his food into the city, sell it for cheap, and then take the train back. It was a much easier mode of transportation. Again, allowing for growth in unreachable areas from previous times. This leads to some changes in daily life. Here's a, a growth form. What I want you to know is that in your Google Slides today, your note slides, you're going to be asked some questions about this. There's three of them. So let me explain to you what's going on. Here, you can see in 1800 the amount of people. Each of these little guys equals 10,000. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 70,000 people here. By 1850, that was one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, three, four, almost five times as many people moved to Birmingham. Look at London. Look at the massive growth in cities. Within 50 years, the cities had tripled, quadrupled. I mean, this guy, we're, we're almost at eightfold. There's a massive movement into the city. Cheap labor and cheap housing creates city booms. Also, it has the introduction of what's called wage labor. Before, if I worked the field, I made my own crops. I could then barter those crops for a blacksmith to get tools. I could barter them for, for shelter. But in the end, I had something. I produced something that I had in my hands. No longer was that the case. If I worked in a factory, that wasn't my shirt. I didn't produce it. I didn't bring in uh, the wall that created the thread. I didn't have the machinery. I simply gave up my time to help this producer make us good. And in exchange for my time, that guy paid me money. So now all of a sudden, people are trading in time for money in an effort to work. That was brand new. This idea of wage labor had just come out due to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's going to be what drives the Cold War later when we split to what wage labor means. But that's, uh, that's for another day. Just know that this, people started working for money as opposed to producing products. Good things, though. We had an increase in health. As things became denser, people found solutions to problems. Sewage, and it wasn't exactly like this bathroom. We had a sewage system. If I had a toilet, it, we found a sewer system in order to flush it out. So I wasn't just leaving it in my house. There's too many people in these crowded buildings. There's stories on stories on stories high. Can you imagine having one universal bathroom? So now we have a sewage system being built so that waste can be taken away from people. Health care increases. Things like vaccines start to come out. Without such high population density, it wasn't necessary. We were okay. So as a result of things like this, we have an increase in health. Which leads to this right here. Move me. This is the population of the world from the beginning, 10,000 BC. So really it's a slow climb. Slow, 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 and bam. Where are we? This is the Industrial Revolution, right where my mouse is. And then look at this. It's almost like it changes overnight. By 1700, at the beginning, we have 600 million. 200 years later, we've doubled that, over doubled that, and we continue to grow from there. With these advances in the, the agricultural and industrial revolution, this is what happened. This is really the effect. We have cheaper, stronger products being made by Europe, and as a result, we have more people that need to be fed. So now all of a sudden, I need more food and more land, and it's going to lead to some of the issues we see in the future. Thanks for listening.